We're coming back to order. Um, first, I want to take a minute. Um, we have Jackson Baynard here. And um, Mr. Baynard, I'd like for you to, if you could give us an update on Congressman McEachin's funeral service arrangements. Uh, members of the board, Mr. Manager, uh, uh, starting uh, late uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, we've been trying to make contact with uh, key stakeholders for uh, Congressman uh, McEachin's funeral. Uh, this morning, we made some progress. We've uh, reached out to St. Paul's Baptist Church, uh, talked to their head of security there. We've been in contact with Captain State Police uh, for this area. Um, Captain Burnett from HPD and myself will be in unified command as we work through this. Uh, we're still waiting to get contacts from U.S. Capitol Police and our Capitol Police here in Virginia to make sure that we get everything buttoned up. Uh, we've requested the Henrico Incident Management Team for assistance for additional planning and logistical support. We'll have that in place at 0800 on Monday morning as we work through it. We do expect to get more information this afternoon as well as things to change over the weekend continue to change on Monday and continue to change on Tuesday. Uh, uh -huh. But we'll be ready to roll uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, the funeral is at 11. Uh, both uh, Henrico Police and Henrico Fire, we are familiar with St. Paul's. We have a, a great working relationship with them. Uh, if we remember about a few years ago, they hosted our 15th anniversary for 9-11. So um, we're, everyone sort of knows each other. So the relationships are built there. And we'll be uh, happy to keep uh, the manager's office representative is Mr. Tina, and we'll keep her up to date as we move forward. And St. Paul's Baptist is on Creighton Road? Creighton Road, yes, ma'am. All righty. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, next, we go with Mr. Emerson, and this is the comprehensive plan update. And we're going to also have Mr. Romanello, but Mr. Manager, do you want to make any remarks? or? No, I just turn it over to Joe. Joe. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Manager, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Mr. Tina. Um, thought you were rid of me, didn't you? After, the, after this, hopefully. Uh, I'm here this morning to talk to you a little bit about our efforts in regards to the comprehensive plan and bring you up to date. Mr. Smith, I'll apologize to you right out of the box because you've seen a lot of this on the Planning Commission this year. Much of this has been reviewed with the Planning Commission, and of course all of you have, uh, have received it in uh, printed printed copies, but um, we haven't had a chance really to talk to you a lot about it. So I'm going to hit some of the highlights, where we are, where we're headed, and, um, and advise you that we're going to be looking for some work sessions with you in the, uh, in the new year to get you up to date and get you more involved in, in where we are with the, um, with the plan. Before we use a timeline, which you've seen before, for the uh, plan update project. Based on uh, board direction in uh, 2021, this timeline was extended to ensure adequate opportunities for community participation. This plan will have a more grassroots approach and the Planning Commission will also be more involved in reviewing feedback on deliverables listed above than in the past. Phase one was devoted to initiating the project. The team established a plan to manage the project and develop the project website and branding. This phase was completed in May of 2021. We're currently finalizing phase two, analyzing trends and conditions, which provides the background of where the county is today and where we are headed based on current trends and future planning influences. It also included the launching of our website and several public outreach efforts to gather input from our residents and stakeholders. Third phase, evaluating growth alternatives, will provide an opportunity to simulate different land use and development choices and determine how those choices might impact community character, transportation systems, and the county's fiscal health. This phase will provide the policy direction for the development of the future land use map which of course is one of the most important components of this plan. In phases four and five, the project team will take the outcomes of the first three phases and complete a draft comprehensive plan for public review. It is anticipated the process will be completed by late spring of 2024. Public engagement is critical for the development of the plan and its adoption. As part of phase two, several surveys and exercises were conducted to gain insight into what matters to our county residents and stakeholders. This feedback will be used to help shape the vision and goals of the plan. 
Input on recreation and parks and transportation was also sought to help develop those specific components of the plan. I'm going to hit on a few highlights of those. Again, with the understanding, we will be going more in depth with you in the not too distant future. In an effort to understand how our residents feel about the quality of life and services in the county, we worked with VCU's Survey Evaluation and Research Laboratory to conduct a statistically valid survey. Invitations were sent to 5,000 randomly selected residential addresses, 1,000 per district, inviting them to participate in a web-based survey. Using 49 questions, respondents were asked their opinions on items such as development, public services, transportation, and related community planning issues. Individuals were given approximately four months to complete and respond to the survey. Postcard reminders were sent and twice during the survey period, hard copies were provided to those who had not answered in, in the event they didn't have access to the internet. The survey response rate was 25.8%, which did exceed the anticipated response rate of 20%. Of the surveys returned, 51 and a half were completed online, with the remaining 48 and a half submitted via paper copies. As you can see on the chart on the slide, the response rates by magisterial district ranged from 18.5% to 22.1%, which indicates consistent representation from across the county. Among the first several questions participants were asked, how would you rate the overall quality of life today in Henrico County using a scale of one to five? The majority of the residents gave positive ratings with over 77% rating it as a four or five, and 97% rated it as three or greater. Among the first several questions, participants were asked. Ms. Allison. Mr. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. With this um, chart, were there, was there a comment link um, enabled? A comment link enabled in? In, in correlation to this particular chart. Like, were they able to check a number and then make a comment about why they checked the number they checked? I believe we didn't have specific comments, did we, Ms. Deemer? Not for this particular one, but there were opportunities where open-ended um, mm -hmm. questions were allowed. Okay. So now in this, some uh, cases, yes, but not in this one. Yeah, this, you know, this number just depresses me. 40% um, of my people are three, and that's mm -hmm. the struggle with Verona. So... Mm -hmm. We have a contingency of people who don't want anything done there, and they're good. But the general, but there's so many people who want more for the district. And uh, I guarantee you that this 39% is the people who are saying, I wish we had more private services like there are in other parts of the county. So that's the struggle, because then if we do any type of case, residential case, then we're going to have a lot of people who are going to fight against any type of development. But I hope that any of Orana residents who are watching this see that 40% of our district um, residents pretty much say we're average based upon everything and everybody else. Um, we're the average part of the county. Uh, and yet we have many, many citizens who brag about how awesome Verona is and they don't want it to change at all. Um, but four out of ten of our citizens are saying that, um, um, you know, we're just, we're the average part of the county. So that, that kind of hurts my heart a little bit. Yes, sir. And Reverend Nelson, in, in order to understand some of these comments better, we have continued community engagement activities that I'll go over as I get further into this presentation that will we'll be out in the community more. We'll be getting feedback more individually and trying to stimulate some of that conversation to, uh, to draw out exactly what you're talking about. Among the first several questions participants were asked, how would you rate the overall quality of life today in Henrico County using a scale of one to five? The majority of residents gave positive ratings, again with over 77% rating it a four or five, and again 97% percent rated at three or higher. And this is a word cloud, and of course you can, you can adjust these in different ways based on the response. And of course we, we chose quality of life because the uh, residents in Henrico seem to value that highly, as you will see. 
Respondents were asked about what their level of satisfaction was with the list of services the county currently provides using the same scale of one to five. Fire and rescue services, libraries, police service, and parks, recreational programs, and active passive recreation facilities all scored high on the satisfaction scale. Public transit and pedestrian safety ranked lowest. The survey then presented a list of planning related services the county provided and asked participants to identify their level of satisfaction with each. Supporting development of businesses and protecting environmental quality scored high on the satisfaction scale, while supporting development of affordable housing to local workers and providing bicycle and pedestrian amenities ranked the lowest. The Recreation and Parks Survey was conducted to better understand how residents feel about the county's recreation and parks services and future priorities. 4,000 randomly selected residential ad addresses, 800 per district, were sent an invitation to participate in a completely web-based survey. In addition, those who completed the community survey were given the opportunity to also provide their input. A follow-up postcard and reminder letter were sent prior to the close of the survey. Overall, 778 responses were received, which exceeded the anticipated number of responses. The next several slides provide general information about the respondents and represent the weighted results of the survey. This table displays the response rates by magisterial district, which ranged from 18.9% to 21.5%. Following questions about use of facilities and frequency of visits, respondents were asked how satisfied they were with the parks, trails, facilities, and programs offered by the Division of Recreation and Parks. Almost 80% of respondents were either somewhat or very satisfied. The Planning Department held a community visioning event on March 23rd to gather additional input from the residents. So this, this was an additional exercise after the survey. Using many of the questions from the surveys, participants were invited to share their ideas and concerns through a series of exercises, including a community poll, an interactive map, and a vision and goals exercise. Interested individuals could participate in real time, in person, or online. For those not able to attend, the exercises were available for four weeks on the project website. We had over 670 participants in this process between March 23rd and April 22nd, and more than 3,000 comments. And again, I'll, I'll emphasize there's a lot more data. I know all of you got it in a huge binder, and we will be going over this with you in more detail in smaller bites at a time in the future. Using software that uh, was provided by public relations and media services, so the county has this software in-house. The planning department was able to ask a series of questions following, and after, and after following some background questions, age, ethnicity, et cetera, participants were asked why they chose to live in the county. Almost half of all respondents, 48%, chose high quality of life. Family-oriented environment, extended family living here, and employment represented another 40%. Participants were then asked to rate the overall quality of life in the county. Over 90% rated it at good, great, or superior. Of course, this was similar as we saw to our mailed survey. Participant, participants were asked, where do you want the county to grow in your magisterial district? Almost half chose growth in already developed areas through infill and redevelopment. Close to 30% would prefer no new growth, but understood it cannot be completely stopped. And we do have some district specific information on that question. During the spring of 2022, the Department of Public Works also posted a draft bike and trails map and encouraged residents and stakeholders to share their thoughts and ideas. 
Over 140 comments were received and will be incorporated into phase three of the process. We don't have the results from that yet available. But of course, again, I'll remind you, as you know, the comprehensive plan is a, is a large document. It examines everything essentially that you're doing in the county. And so each one of these things I'm going through becomes background for the drafting of the, of the final document. The consultants have prepared a summary report of all the input received as part of the phase two efforts. It is posted on the project website. It provides links to the results of the visioning exercise and the two survey reports and comments from the bike trails exercise. There are also summaries of the various open-ended questions posed to participants. So it's out there for the, uh, for the public to take a look at. Using all four sources, there were four key themes, or there were key themes identified from community input. They include strong support for more bicycle and pedestrian facilities, strong support for protection of environmentally sensitive lands, open spaces, and rural area, emphasis on value of providing a safe environment for residents, management of the location of future growth with a preference for redevelopment and infill, support for addressing affordable housing needs. This input will be used to draft a set of goals and objectives for the 2045 plan. It will also be used in phase three to assist in the development of alternative growth scenarios to compare with the existing 2026 plan. And to clarify a comment earlier where we were talking in, during affordable housing about creating a policy, this is where that would be. It would be in your affordable housing section or your housing section or your comprehensive plan and we would have a policy that then staff could use when negotiating zoning cases to bring forth suggestions for inclusion of elements of affordable housing. So currently it's not, uh, it's not prohibited that you, that, you, that you can't proffer that, you can proffer that. So I don't want you to be confused that currently you're not prohibited from proffering affordable housing elements, but within your plan you don't have the, the language that assists the development community and others when they're looking at developing in the county because this is the blueprint that not only we use but that the development community and residents use when they're, they're looking to, to build or develop projects in the county. So that's, that's important. In addition to the community outreach, the consultants and staff have produced three assessments identifying existing conditions in the county. They include reports on socio-demographics, transportation, and recreation and parks. And the following slides provide samples of the summary data from each of the reports. The socio-demographic profile provides information on population, households, income, and poverty, employment, and other characteristics. It contains information on the county's population between 1900 and 2020. We went from 30,062 people to 334,389 people in that uh, length of time. As seen on this graph, the county has experienced positive population growth since the 1920 census, despite three annexations. And as all of you are aware, there was a moratorium on annexations placed in 1987 by the General Assembly. This graph compares the county's growth to that of the region and the Commonwealth over the last 30 years. We continue to experience growth, but not at the rate exhibited between 1990 and 2000. As part of the 2045 planning process, we are updating the 2015 Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Plan, which was incorporated into the 2026 plan. The existing conditions report examines current conditions of facilities and amenities. This information, along with the input received from Rec and Parks Survey, will help the Division of Recreation and Parks better understand community needs. The county recreation and parks holdings can be grouped into seven categories. Those identified on the slide as well as school-based facilities and properties owned by the county not specifically programmed for a particular, particular use. 
Neighborhood parks are generally three to 20 acres and serve surrounding subdivisions. They may include play equipment, court games, picnic shelters, and other amenities. Community parks can range in size from 20 to 100 acres and are meant to serve those living within a three mile radius. Amenities may include themed playgrounds, fishing sites, and scenic open spaces. County parks are usually over 100 acres in size and offer the widest range of amenities. In addition to those previously mentioned, there may be tournament quality facilities, a recreation or nature center, and a variety of other active and passive recreational opportunities provided. This map identifies the county's neighborhood, community, and county parks as well as specialty and athletic facilities. The Division of Recreation and Parks manages 106 sites, including a number of school-based resources. They maintain over 3,200 acres of parkland, as well as 122,175 square feet of indoor recreation, recreation space. So they're, they're a busy group. The third assessment focuses on the county's multimodal transportation network. Used to carry people and goods into and through the county, the report summarizes bike, pedestrian, transit, rail, and air service in the county. The consultants performed a safety summary analyzing crash data to highlight areas of potential concern. Between January 1, 2016 and January 1, 2021, there were a total of 28,042 crashes in the county. This map identifies crash clusters during that five-year period. The highest incidents occurred along West Broad Street between I-64 and Pouncey Track Road. Other areas include the intersections of West Broad and Gaskins, West Broad and Glenside, Staples Mill and I-64 and I-64 and Laburnum. The resident survey and responses from, community from the community visioning event identify concerns about safety for cyclists and pedestrians. Between January, January 1, 2016 and January 1, 2021, there were 128 collisions involving bicycles and 357 involving pedestrians. A significant amount of both bicycles and pedestrian crashes occurred along West Broad Street between Parham Road and Staples Mill Road. A number of fatalities have occurred in that area, as well as along Mechanicsville Turnpike. Our current plan was adopted in 2009. And since that time, there have been numerous changes to existing conditions in the county, which is why having three, the three completed reports I just mentioned is so critical. As we approach the horizon year of 2026, it provides us the opportunity to review the most recent census data and identify any shifts in sociodemographic characteristics. It also provides an opportunity to address state legislation implemented since the 2026 plan's adoption. Finally, due to the long-range nature of the plan, it is difficult to predict shifts in the market. As the plan ages, it is not uncommon to receive rezoning requests that deviate from the plan. Land use designations should be evaluated to ensure they represent current conditions and identified development trends. And I have some information for you on this. You've seen the population density slides before, but I think they, they give us some good information so I'm going to run through a few of these quickly for you. As previously mentioned, changes in demographics are a reason to update the plan. These slides again depict how the county's overall density has increased from 0.75 persons per acre in 1960 to 2.14 persons per acre in 2020. And I think paying close attention to the density movement is, uh, is what's interesting in these. Here's the 1980 slide. Jumping to 2000, you can see the West End filling up, and we arrive in 2020. There are very few greenfield development opportunities remaining in Tuckahoe and Three Chopped. Those parts of the county have not just grown out, but as, as you know, they are growing upward as multi-story buildings, apartments, duplexes, and mixed-use developments. The Brooklyn and Fairfield districts have also become denser, 
Libby Mill and the impending Green City development will further increase densities in this area, along with the activity that we're seeing in Westwood. It is not surprising that the growth has begun to move east. Okay. This table identifies rezoning requests received since adopting the 2026 plan and whether the, the decisions that were made were consistent with future land use designations. As you know, the plan is a guide, but we try to do our best. And with your help, we try to, try to get the designations where they need to be on these properties so people will be aware of what the development pattern will be. With the exception of 2015 and 2018, rezoning requests have been consistent with the 2026 plan. So the Planning Commission and the Board did a, did a pretty good job with the, uh, with the plan in 2009. I did want to take a look, and these are some of the things that we are going to look at and are looking at in terms of making future recommendations on the plan. This table illustrates which future land use designations were most inconsistent with the 2026 20, future land use designations. Since 2009, 38 rezoning requests deviated from the office future land use designation. There may be multiple explanations for this trend, including the after effects of the Great Recession and the shift to work from home that has resulted from the pandemic. Um, I can tell you there's very little market for office, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, the county's office areas are experiencing large vacancies right now, and the trend is away from office. However, in the plan, you're going to want to try to keep some office for the future development of the county. The land that you can, can reserve is, is limited, really, as you can see from the slides as they, they filled in. So we need, to, um, we need to take a hard look at that as we... Um, as we work our way through the update. During the last year, the department and EDA has seen an increased interest in large site industrial properties. And I know this comes to no, as of no surprise to you. Analysis of the land designated industrial on the 2026 future land use map was conducted. Approximately 61% of that land is currently developed with an additional 3% underdeveloped 35% of the property is still considered developable. In 2009, when the current plan was adopted, there were 5,479 acres of vacant land designated as industrial on the future land use map. Over the last 13 years, 20% has been developed with approximately 7% under construction. So you hear that number and you say, well, Mr. Emerson, why do you, why do you think why are you concerned about industrial property? Well, if you take a look at it, the image on the right identifies the percentage of developable land by acreage. Only 23% of the properties are greater than 100 acres, the need, size needed for a larger user. Additionally, almost half of the acreage, 46.1%, consists of parcels which are 25 acres or less. So for small users, that's great. For the uh, large users that, um, that you like to see come in that create large amounts of jobs and revenue for the county, it's a little bit more difficult. This map de depicts vacant industrially designated properties with easy access to the airport, the Norfolk Southern Railway, and several controlled access highways, making them very attractive for development. While many are suitable for small users, multiple parcels would need to be assembled and purchased to acquire sufficient land for the larger projects that we've been seeing recently. Because the 2045 plan will continue to encourage balanced growth that supports a tax base ratio of at least 65% to a residential 35% 65% residential to 35% commercial, it is critical we evaluate land use designations to ensure they represent current conditions and our identified trends. Joe, let me ask you a question about that. Yes, sir. Are you, so every year we get an update as we go through the budget, revenue briefing, uh, finance gives us the latest information you do. Are you seeing any difference in that ratio? 
I have to ask finance to uh, probably contribute I mean, to so that. So we I haven't as of last year, but are you seeing anything or do you sense anything? As far as the trends I'm seeing, I, I'd say that's shifting some and it's concerning. And I think some, of course, you know, when I look at the land use map, I, I look at, say, a multifamily apartment complex is residential. Finance looks at it as, as a commercial entity. So, so when, you, when you do the calculation, what they calculate for the balance and what I calculate for the balance are, are a little, little different. So, Madam Chair, with your indulgence, they've let, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but if you throw out apartments, if you exclude those from the calculation, and you hone in on the commercial on the business side, is that where you're seeing? Is that what you're worried about? Yes, sir. That's that's where I would be concerned. And that is because you're you're getting out of balance. That you, sixty-five thirty-five is is pushing up. And you simply don't have greenfield sites. That's correct. All right. Yeah, Thank we you. Don't, we don't have large greenfield sites, and what we do have are redevelopment sites for the most part. As I know, in the past, we've been closer to the 70-30. Yes, ma'am. But I'm sure Mr. Romanello would, would report on this, that the, the industrial uses that we're seeing, they need 400 acres or something like that, contiguous or all together. Yes, ma'am. So that was why your comment about the slide that said industrial designated land, somebody's going to buy, has to buy up all those little parcels to, come, to make one couple hundred acres, I guess, but... Correct. They're looking for 400 acres. Correct. So, yeah, in, in large, large, large yeah. In large parcels that have the adequate infrastructure, your roads, your water, your sewer, your electrical service, those are hard to come by. And, you know, I could, I can name them off for you practically. That's how, that's how few there are. Um, so the smaller parcels are numerous. But when you go out and you have to purchase land and there are a lot of divided interests, uh, many industrial prospects would look at that and go, hey, guys, if you don't have that site I need, this community over here has it. Why, why did, I don't have time for that, nor do I, I want to incur the expense of, of purchasing multiple properties. So it's, um, it's certainly uh, a game changer. We only have so much land. You know, they're not making any more land, and, uh, and it, it becomes a squeeze. Henrico is maturing as a community, and uh, that's, again, as I stated, it's based on the growth maps that I showed you. It's uh, not surprising that growth is headed east. As part of phase four, we'll work to develop the new plan Existing land uses will be identified and reviewed, and alternate growth scenarios will be evaluated before developing recommended future land use designations. In addition, we'll include measures for construction, rehabilitation, and maintenance of affordable housing. Again, I want to draw that out because we've been talking about affordable housing. One thing that we're very focused on is making sure that, uh, that we have a good housing chapter this time around instead of an appendices and it's adopted in the document and addresses what the board feels needs to be, be set forth in that area. You'll recall the residence surveys indicated an increased desire to walk, bike, or use public transit. The county is a strong supporter of public transit as is evidenced by the fact that we are currently the largest local contributor to the GRTC. In addition, to a separate bike and trails plan, an updated major thoroughfare plan map, or the MTP, as you hear me refer to it on many occasions. The Department of Public Works Transportation Division is working to identify and program sidewalk retrofit projects across the county, as you're aware, and you can see it when you drive through the county, what's going on. It's exciting. The section on parks, recreation, open space, and cultural resources will be revised and informed by the results of the 2021 Rec Park Survey. We'll review the county's public facilities and utilities and provide more guidance on solar facilities, as well as including strategies to provide broadband infrastructure. 
In addition to these topics, we know that many of our residents have reached out regarding the county's natural resources and impacts from new development. Chapter 8 of your existing plan, Natural Resources, covers physical constraints to development including floodplains, wetlands, steep slopes, soils, and endangered and threatened species. It also addresses protect protection of potable water, point and non-point source pollution, air quality, noise, and access to the James and Chickahominy rivers. It contains 10 detailed maps and 18 policies to guide development decisions across the county. Of course, we'll continue those efforts and we're going to bolster those efforts. As you are aware, the county, in conjunction with federal and state agencies, also protects the environment through detailed review of development plans. In addition to the guidance provided by the 2026 plan, the county code provides specific requirements for development and how it impacts the environment. Monitoring throughout the development process ensures these requirements are met and that any issues are quickly dealt with in an appropriate manner. The environmental focus has also led to the adoption of new and updated requirements for development in the county through the new zoning ordinance. The updated requirements for open space, native plantings, and tree cover were incorporated into the recently affected, effective zoning ordinance. And while we believe existing guidance and ordinances provide a high level of environmental protection, we do believe additional consideration could and should be given to expanding the natural resources chapter in the 2045 plan to cover issues related to environmental sustainability. The United Nations defines sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. On a local level, this would include current efforts such as requiring open space and the use of native species in development projects. New elements such as environmentally friendly design and renewable energy will also be explored. We have a uh, design portion of the comp plan. We will incorporate those design features. We have many of them now. We're going to pull that uh, design element out of the appendices, make it a chapter of the plan, and add to it and enhance it. The updated chapter will also include goals, objectives, and policies to further expand our environmental efforts and recommend new initiatives where appropriate. And you'll be hearing from Mr. Yab and Ms. Tratina tomorrow about uh, other environmental efforts of the county. And with that group working along with, uh, along with the update of the plan, we'll pull all of that together and uh, bring forward to you a, a very relevant natural resources and sustainability chapter of the plan. Following a review of existing conditions and the identification of remaining developable land, we'll develop alternative growth scenarios. There will be an opportunity for the community to review and provide input. As part of phase five, we'll bring the entire plan back to the public once the vision goals and objectives have been drafted. It will include a future land use plan, a major thoroughfare plan, a new bike and trails plan, an updated recreation parks and open space plan, and accompanying implementation items. During this time, there will be opportunities for our residents and business owners to provide feedback on recommendations and submit suggested changes to the future land use designations on specific properties. I do want to use this plan to make a very, very strong connection with utilities and roads so we can have what I'll call capital improvement investment areas to guide our land use designations so the development community and others will know where your capital improvements plan is taking you so they can make good decisions and, and help you as well in your capital improvement planning. So that's one of the goals. Public engagement today. The department has already completed several efforts to engage the public as I, I reviewed with you. These included the residents in recreation and park surveys, the project website, a community visioning event, a draft bike plan mapping exercise, and attendance at a variety of town hall and community meetings. As we move forward, we have plans to further engage the public. Flyers will be posted at county facilities encouraging people to visit the project website and sign up for our mailing list. We've also developed an interactive map that will go live this month, which I'm very excited about. 
the last time we did this, if you had a land use or a concern, you had to call us, come see us, write us a letter, send us an email, and we maintained a large binder uh, of all these comments and we responded to everyone. With this tool going on our website, you'll be able to go on to the website, you'll be able to clip, click on the site that you have a comment, concern, or thought about, and, uh, and write that comment on that map and we'll be able to go in and pull it off and, and fold that into the process. And as we did last time, we'll respond to everybody as to what that education is. As uh, several of you will remember, when we did this last time, we pulled all those together by district. We sat down with each, uh, each board member, went over the maps of their district, talked about the comments we, we had received, talked about other issues and things, infrastructure, comments from your constituents, your thoughts of what was driving the land uses in your area. And uh, it takes a little time on your part and our part, but I think it, as was evidenced, by the consistency of your decisions with the plan, it's an effort well worth making. And I look forward to spending that time with each of you as we move through this process again. Uh, let's see, we've got, we've got uh, the interactive map. There will be a form on the project website for stakeholders and local community groups to request a planner to speak at an upcoming meeting. And for those wishing to participate as an organized group and have a self-facilitated meeting, we are going to provide materials for what we call a self-guided meeting in a box. So if you had a group coming over to your house and you wanted to talk about land use and the comp plan, you could contact us, we would give you these materials. What's going to go into this box? Um, we're going to give them information about community overview, the demographics, things of that nature, highlight a project stemming from the 2026 plan, and, um, and then they'll have a questionnaire to fill out with their group, and they'll provide that back to us. So we're going to have ample opportunities um, through the next, uh, next several months as we put the information together to gather additional information from the community, and we look forward to uh, working with the community as well. Joe, what did you call that again? You said a house meeting in a box? It's what, a meeting in that? a box. If you had a group over to your house or you had a, a party, you had a, a poker game, and you went, and everybody said, hey, you know, in between we're going, we're going to talk about county land use, uh, you, would, you, would come get, you would come get this box from us, and... Uh, and in between your breaks for your, your refreshments and things, you would discuss county land use. Then you would fill out a form for us and you would send it back to us with your comments. Wow. And uh, I'm sure it would be engaging uh, conversation wow. for any wow. type of activity that you might want to undertake. Okay, that's what I thought. I thought I heard you say that, so I just wanted to make sure I'm verifying it's, that uh, I heard that. <laughs> it's it's self-facilitated is the key there. Hey, if it's the, bike, the cyclists and the joggers, you probably mm -hmm. could get a little input. So. Yes, ma'am. I think there are a lot of groups out there that might respond, respond to this. And, of course, we also are willing to meet with the organized groups. So we'll be reaching out to some of the organizations in the county to see if they need speakers so we can come speak to them. We did that with, this, with the effort the last time. And we're just moving into that phase in the January, February, March timeframe, we'll, we'll really begin in earnest working on that. In addition to these efforts, uh, the county's public relations department will be creating content for the website in the form of YouTube videos and also podcasts. A mailer will be sent to all residents informing them of upcoming efforts. And again, we'll make ourselves available for any meetings that uh, are requested of us. As mentioned earlier, we have completed numerous background reports which have been presented to the Planning Commission and posted on the project website, and of course you've received hard copy of. And I would, as I've mentioned, I'd like to schedule a series of work sessions to review, review all of these documents. The manager and I have been discussing this and uh, we'll be seeing a lot of each other in the new year before your board meetings probably to to bite this off in smaller pieces. In addition to what you've seen, we anticipate having the results of a separate market assessment, housing assessment, 
in a non-residential housing nexus study available to review with you in the new year. And I think reviewing some of the rough drafts of those documents, I think some of that information you're going to find very interesting and it will provide good guidance for you. Mm -hmm. That concludes what I have to uh, present to you this morning. I would invite everyone to visit the project website at www.henriconext.us. And of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. And I believe Mr. Romanella has a few comments for you as well. Any questions from members of the board? I have a couple. <laughs> um, Mr. Emerson, the, uh, you made the comment preserving office space. Mm -hmm. For the future, I, I don't I don't disagree with that. But wouldn't you see the uh, office market going into more of a renovation uh, than than uh, needing new? Yes, because sir. If, if you break down um, on Broad Street, the what is it called? Brook Brookfield Brookfield has a lot of empty space. Yes, Innsbruck sir. has a lot of empty space. Uh, the, the, the park on Ga uh, Gaskins has a lot of empty space. All of those can go up. Yes, sir. So wouldn't we want to focus office-wise on some sort of initiatives to get newcomers to the county that need office space to, to go up as opposed to uh, broadening the the sprawl of office yes sir i think that's that's a strategy and that's something we need to discuss i don't think you have greenfield necessarily available to designate for office so i think one of the things of course that comes out of your comprehensive plan is guidance for any changes and adjustments you may need to your zoning ordinance and also um, from that your land use maps so there may be instances in the office, existing office areas, where we need to have programs that encourage the redevelopment of those areas. We're already doing quite a bit of that, as you know, in Innsbruck. A lot of that has currently um, surfaced as the addition, of course, of multifamily to get the live, work, play going. But as those office buildings age, we need to, uh, we need to look at ways to work with the office development community. And, uh, and within our codes to be flexible, to allow those buildings to redevelop. I mean, Innsbruck's been taken great care of over the years, and you would never know it's 30 plus years old because of the way it's been maintained, and that's, that's great office space and is in high demand. But at some point, every building uh, hits the end of its life cycle. So yes, I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing some of that in, in Westwood area, as you know. I think the Brookfield site is one of the best development opportunities in the region. Um, unfortunately, uh, Genworth decided that they would, fortunately and unfortunately, I think it's really good that they moved into the former SunTrust building, but we've got a potential for a nice office mixed use project on that property due to Genworth's foresight and in, in purchasing a large amount of it, holding it whole as one property owner certainly makes it attractive to, to redevelop. You've got opportunities in other areas, uh, Reynolds Crossing, uh, Coger Center, uh, where buildings could be, you can either add to, you can go up, add decks, or you can, uh, you can renovate, tear down, rebuild. So it's very much a discussion similar to what we're talking about in the housing realm of what does the county need to do and what can we do to encourage the redevelopment of office. There's a lot of trends and one of our local office developers sent uh, Mr. Romanella and myself a presentation yesterday that had some information in it. And, and it's still, there's still a lot of uncertainty as to what the work from home impact is on existing office space. And so I, I don't know how that eventually is going to play out. We're going to have to be flexible and nimble in how we respond to that. I would agree. I would agree because the, the best kept secret that's not kept is our tax rate uh, on 
standard tax rate can be lowered as we've done forever, keep lowering it down due to our business. So the businesses are key. And I, I just, I think we need more incentives to get new corporations to come in and redo what's in place that infrastructure mm -hmm. has already addressed for traffic and so forth to, to generate mm -hmm. a better office community right where it's, mm -hmm. it's designated now. Yes, sir. I, I don't disagree. You've got the infrastructure there. In some cases, and I think you'll be hearing from Mr. Chan later in this, um, in this retreat exercise regarding infrastructure, but I think upgrading and increasing our infrastructure in redeveloping areas is extremely important, as you know from the experiences in Innsbruck and some of the efforts we're doing there. Uh, the, the experiences in Westwood, we've, we've got exactly what you're talking about in terms of Kinsale Insurance going in, taking a piece of property, building a nice office building. It was, uh, it was really somewhat of a brownfield property. And uh, really very little had to happen there in order to, in, in order to enable that to happen. But uh, EDA did get inventive for us and, and help make that happen with some financial instruments to create some incentive to, for a parking deck that helped that property happen. Madam Chair, my last one. Uh, your party in a box. Mm -hmm. Can you... Uh, <laughs> Can you get us all information on that, what, what's included in that party in the box? Yes, sir. Because that party in the box, I think, would be very beneficial to HOAs. Mm -hmm. I know of probably eight HOAs I would call and say, I don't think I'm going to go to Mr. Nelson's and Mr. Schmidt's to uh, have a cocktail and, and say, let's, <laughs> let's look at this. Uh, I, I think it will go uh, towards HOAs. Gotcha. Yes, sir, we can do that. No offense, I, I will if you ask me. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Chair, that's all I have. Next, Mr. Romanello, was he gonna be speaking? Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Joe. Mm. Note to self, I won't be going to Joe's house for a poker game. <laughs> Madam Chairman, members of the board, the county manager asked me uh, this afternoon to give you uh, an update and our thoughts on what the future of economic development, what the future of growing our county's economy for all will look like over the next several years. Back in 2020, we updated <clears throat> our strategic plan, and part of that was reframing our mission, which you see on the screen here, growing Henrico's economy for all, and those last two words are the most important because we know, despite the fact that we have a $25 billion plus economy, that we're second only to Fairfax and the number of jobs in the Commonwealth of Virginia, that our median family income is $70,000 a year. And we remember every day that half of our families live on less than $70,000 a year. And it's our job to make sure that we continue to grow the economy for all of Henrico. So the first thing that I want to do is say thank you. This slide is a thank you note because we do have a world-class toolkit here in Henrico, and I think this speaks to Mr. Brandon's questions to Mr. Emerson just a, just a minute ago. As the county manager mentioned earlier today, the HIP zones, which were enacted uh, earlier this year and were uh, uh, administered by Mr. Lebo's department, were leveraging $88 in private investment for every $1 in public investment. Your policies over the last several years continue to reap dividends, continue to pay dividends with substantial investments in our industrial base, in the data center base, and throughout our businesses with uh, the BPO threshold increasing and private investment increasing by all of those businesses. Fast track permitting. Every local government in the country says they have fast track permitting. In Henrico, we don't have to say that. What we say to a prospective business is call QTS, call Meta, call Mondelez, call Thermo Fisher Scientific. They will tell you their experience with the development agencies uh, here in Henrico, CEO to CEO, that they can understand that when we say we do things quickly, we absolutely mean it and we've got good private sector 
uh, validation of that. Since 2019, agreements enacted by the EDA and backed uh, by the Board of Supervisors have leveraged $1.4 billion in private investment. This gives us maximum flexibility in meeting the needs of the business community and helping to continue to grow our economy. You heard earlier about the flexibility that we have with zoning and land use regulations, form-based code. Mr. Emerson mentioned the Kinsale building, which is in the, on the screen there. That's a great example of what we can do with the zoning <clears throat> and land use flexibility that we have here in Henrico. Since 2020, particularly with some recent changes that the Board of Supervisors made to the Enterprise Zone program, we've seen over $600 million in private investment in the Enterprise Zones. The Innsbruck Technology Zone, also enacted earlier this year by the Board of Supervisors, is doing well. We had one announcement with EAB moving uh, into the old SunTrust building and expanding. We'll have another announcement in the coming weeks of a, a further uh, corporate office headquarters coming into the Innsbruck Technology Zone. And your recent amendments to the Commercial Tax Rehab Credit continue to pay dividends for our community, 124 commercial tax rehab projects in the last three years that have leveraged or added nearly $400 million to our tax base here in Henrico. Our target sectors continue to resonate. One of the fortunate things that we have in this job is that we don't chase projects that aren't consistent with who we are as a community. We know who we are as a community and we chase the, the projects that are good for Henrico, that are consistent with our values as a community. In advanced manufacturing, we have a substantial manufacturing base in the county, and we've had a particular focus this year, as the board is aware, to try to attract uh, semiconductor projects to Henrico. What uh, was noted earlier uh, during Mr. Emerson's session is that while we don't have a thousand acre sites that are available in the county, we are working a number of what's called, uh, believe it or not, they're called niche semiconductor projects which are relatively small for the industry, but they're still multi-billion dollar uh, projects which we can accommodate in Henrico. Uh, corporate services, data centers, uh, finance and insurance, our life sciences, we have a very strong R&D initiative which the Board of Supervisors supported further earlier this year by lowering the business personal property tax rate on uh, data centers, professional services, and of course, uh, supply chain management. So in our minds, the future of economic development, the future of growing our economy falls into three very large categories, people, place, and opportunity, starting with people. <clears throat> Working with our partners, we continue to advance the county SWAM goals and the ESG goals, <clears throat> environmental social governance goals of our corporate partners. And with every expansion and every attraction project, we're mining for opportunities to engage our workforce, working with uh, Henrico Schools, CTE, Reynolds Community College, the Capital Region Workforce Partnership, and our higher education partners toward uh, advancing economic mobilities. Workforce development in Virginia is fragmented. It's a very challenging system to navigate, particularly for a business that is expanding. The state, uh, through VDP, has made some headway with uh, new businesses coming in through their Talent Accelerator Program. But for existing businesses that are expanding or who are just trying to retool their workforce, it's a really challenging system uh, to navigate. We look forward to working with the consolidated agency that the Yonkin administration is putting together and helping our, uh, our businesses continue to grow and to uh, make sure that they can have the workforce they need for the future. Place is absolutely critical. Having a sense of place is now as essential uh, for our businesses as having good infrastructure, water, sewer, uh, fiber. We continue to work with property owners, with brokers, to reposition existing buildings as well as new development into places that embrace the innate desire to live and work, play and learn uh, in the communities where we are. We also hope to work with the county team, with, uh, with Mr. Emerson and with uh, Mr. Lebo and their teams to identify obsolete buildings or buildings that uh, no longer uh, meet the needs of the, of the public, particularly old retail stores, potentially some old bank buildings. So those, either those buildings or those properties can be repurposed um, productively. And as Joe mentioned earlier and the board just discussed, uh, we are working with his team during the comp plan process to ensure we have industrial sites for future quality advanced manufacturing and high-tech uh, data center development. Turning to the opportunity, 
side, we continue to position Henrico in central Virginia as a global internet hub. We had a very successful network access point summit on November the 8th at the Short Pump Hilton. We had folks from the industry from six continents, got everybody except from uh, Antarctica to come to Henrico to talk about digital infrastructure. And uh, we had a very robust discussion about putting uh, our county and our community uh, on the map. Robust conversations continue with our partners on lab space and research and development. And as the board is aware, Thermo Fisher announced, Thermo Fisher Scientific announced their third expansion in Henrico, adding nearly $100 million and 500 jobs. And the vast majority of that expansion is in an old Toys R Us building. So who says Henrico can't figure it out? Who says Henrico can't redevelop and reposition buildings? We took a Toys R Us and turned it into a bioanalytical lab with hundreds of jobs. We're revamping our marketing <clears throat> efforts in collaboration with Richmond Region Tourism, uh, Chamber RVA, and the Greater Richmond Partnership to tell our story about why this is the place to live, why this is the place to raise a family. We tested the internet during the pandemic. It worked. We now know that knowledge workers can work anywhere in the world so long as they're Wi-Fi. They have Wi-Fi. If they can work any in the, anywhere in the world, why not in Henrico? And so while we are concerned about those vacancies that was just discussed in our offices, I believe that offers a tremendous opportunity for us to bring for uh, companies that are expanding, companies that are in the position of renovating their office space. There is a flight to quality right now to higher quality office space to try to attract people to come back to the office. We're well positioned to help folks with, uh, with upgrading their buildings with the flexibility that I mentioned earlier, and also to bring companies from higher tax states, uh, from states that aren't uh, right to work uh, states, and states that simply don't have the business climate that Virginia offers and that Henrico uh, offers in particular. And what I say in every community presentation that I do is to tell the world about us because the last thing we want to be is anybody's best kept secret. Uh, we want the world uh, to know that Henrico is uh, the best place uh, to do business. And this is truly a team sport in economic development. We've got 10 people uh, in our uh, EDA, but uh, we do it through the partnership with hundreds if not thousands of people. And we really believe that these entities and many more are force multipliers, that doing economic development in the future is going to be more and more about how we can leverage partnerships. And without the partnerships of everyone in this room and uh, all of the entities that are shown on the screen, uh, we're not gonna be in a position to grow the economy as we need to uh, for the future of our county. And with that, Madam Chairman, I'm happy to take your questions. Any questions? I, I got Go just one comment. Uh, what, well, two, one question, one comment. What happened on the Antarctica thing? They just didn't want to come? I'm, so <clears throat> I'm sorry to disappoint the board, uh, Mr. Schmidt. We'll get it next time. Room for improvement. So, Mr. Romanello, thank you uh, for this additional piece. Um, I just want to make a comment on this slide, not only for my colleagues' information, but really for you and your team and all of our county team. Just yesterday, I was in a room with these folks. You know, we had a Richmond Region Tourism Board meeting, and on that board sits GRP and sits the chamber. And this that discussion that you just talked about with regard to workforce development and all the regional conversations about um, using these force multipliers is occurring exactly as you want it to. It occurred yesterday. Less than 24 hours ago, we discussed this exact same thing with those partners. So um, we appreciate you including that slide and making note of that because the strength of what we're trying to do includes includes those those folks on that on that board too. Thank you, sir. It absolutely does. Any other comments?